Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled, Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing in His Mission. Not our mission, His Mission. And this is lesson number eight in that series for August 22 of 2020, entitled, Ministering Like Jesus. Ministering Like Jesus. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come once again counting on your presence and your guidance as we study together these lessons which are prepared for us at such expense and such uh, real challenge by people who are doing their very best to prepare things for the whole world to study. May we learn from this lesson more about the things that we could do and should do to spread the good news is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Jim, what do we know about ministering like Jesus? Jesus generally cared for the people, cared for people. He was more interested in their concerns and the needs than in, than in his own. His life was totally centered on other people. His was a ministry of loving compassion. He met the physical, mental, and emotional needs of the people around him and thus their hearts were open to the spiritual truths he taught. As he healed lepers, opened blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, delivered demoniacs, fed the hungry, and cared for the needy, hearts were touched and lives changed. That's because as people saw his, gro his genuine concern, they were open to the spiritual truths that he taught. Adult Bible said, Bible study guide for Sabbath, August 15. Christ's method alone was, excuse me, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. There is needed excuse me, there is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would have would be seen. Oh hold on, wait, 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 hold on. What would that be like? Less time were given to sermonizing? How much time, how many man hours we use at the university church every time there's a sermon? Now, I'm not knocking what Randy does. He does a great job. But what if we spent even a small portion of that time, all those people there, out witnessing in the community? Or interacting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, go ahead. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted. The ignorant instruction... Instructed. Instructed. The experienced counsel, the, in the inexperienced counseled, we are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fault. Ellen White? Fruit. Fruit. Well, fruit. I'm sorry. Okay. Mystery of healing. Mystery of healing. 143. Wow. So, what is it, what, what, what's she really saying there? She's saying we as people who go to church and listen to sermons are supposed to be carrying those messages home and sharing them with our neighbors, with our friends, with our co-workers and so forth. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Imagine what would happen if every church member were active in some way and spreading the gospel. Man. Kind of like yeah, that church you attended when yeah. you were yep. back in Maryland. Yeah. In our day, do people need a demonstration of the gospel as well as its proclamation? How many people have given serious time to thinking about the life of Jesus you think in of our world? Demonstration that's more in the nature of teaching yeah. uh, than just words yeah. out there. What would happen if someone with the care and concern of Jesus were to minister to lives in our day? 
Have you thought about that out there? Jesus was so considerate of others, even the most despised, that the religious leaders of his time accused him of, quote, receiving sinners and eating with them. I mean, terrible sin. <laughs> Their religion consisted largely of avoiding anything that they considered to be sinful. By contrast, Jesus remained uncontaminated by sin, but associated with the world's sinners. So what was his advice to us? Gary? You are like salt for the whole human race, but if salt loses its saltiness, there is no way to make it salty again. It has become worthless, so it is thrown out and people trample on it. You are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. And that's from the Holy Bible Good News Translation. Salt was considered to be so important and valuable in the ancient world that there was a time when Roman legions used it as currency. Wow. While it was used for preserving and flavoring food, it was considered to be a symbol of great wealth. I'm going to ask us to jump back to that question. You know, in my early years as a child, I couldn't understand what they were talking about, salt losing its saltiness. Yeah. I mean, we get salt in nice little packages that's yes. pure sodium chloride. If salt loses its, that salt, that salt loses its salt, there's nothing left. Yeah. But then I found out that in many parts of the world, people go and they dig up like even clay kind of stuff with some salt in it, and they use that as their, as their version of salt. Yeah. Well, then you can understand what would happen. And remember that salt is very water-soluble, so if you, if you took some of that stuff and you wa washed it a little bit, pretty soon all the salt would be gone. What you have left is just the, yeah. the clay, basically. It was a preservative, too. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Salt, in order to be of use, must permeate completely the substance to which it is added. In the same way, Christians, according to Jesus, are to be in the world, but not of the world. Do you know what happens to bread if you forget to put the salt in? Bread, you said? Yeah. Probably wouldn't rise. No, it rises. In fact, it rises too much. Okay. Salt, salt dampens down the, 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 the rising power, the yeast oh. effects of the yeast. Okay. And so if you, leave, if you leave the salt out, you end up with bread that's a bit, a bit tasteless. You can, it's obviously different. And, and it's, <laughs> it just pops right out of the pan. Yeah. So uh, listen to the experience of someone who used to bake, bake 40 loaves of bread every day. <laughs> Christians are also supposed to be the light of the world. Darkness can never overcome light. Light always pierces darkness. There's never any competition. If there's a, you put a light, even the least bit of little light, in a dark room, what happens? It fills the room, right? Yeah. But remaining pure and righteous in a world that is growing more and more wicked is a challenge. So Jesus prayed for us. John seventeen fifteen to 18. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. I, just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I sent them into the world just as you sent me into the world. Okay, try to think about the implications of that. God sent his son, of course, all the way from heaven down to this earth. And now Jesus is saying, I am sending these feeble human beings out into the communities, out into the places around here, just as you sent me is he's implying about what he wants them to do? Obviously, he's, they, they do not have divine character, although I will say it's very interesting, the very first time that we have recorded that Jesus sent the, his disciples out two by two to work in Galilee, he said, heal the uh, heal the sick, heal the, uh, uh, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. You think they actually did that on their very first missionary trip? I don't know. No. But that's what he told them. 
Well, one of the things that made Jesus unique was his ability to bring out the best in people. People marveled at his grace and his words. Look, for example, Luke 4, 22. They were all well impressed with him and marveled at the eloquent words that he spoke. They said, isn't he the son of Joseph? And that was the beginning of trouble. Why was that a beginning of trouble? You mean that kid that lived down the street is claiming to be the Messiah? That's impossible. Pretty sure they're trying to throw him off the cliff, right? Yeah. Well, look at this story from Matthew 8, verses 5 to 10. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a Roman officer met him and begged for help. If you read Ellen White's full account of this, and if you actually, if you just take the Gospels and you take this story and you put all the parts together, you realize, you realize that, first of all, the centurion sent, sent some people he thought would have that would be familiar with Jesus. He sent them, said, please ask him if he would, if he would pray for my, for my servant and so forth. And Jesus kept getting closer and closer to his house. And he said, well, send some more people. No, no, you don't need to come. Finally, he went himself. And Jesus said, and then what he said, finally he said, sir, my servant is sick in bed at home, unable to move and suffering terribly. I will go and make him well, Jesus said. And you know that Jesus is doing this on purpose. Yeah. Oh, no, sir, answered the officer. I do not deserve to have you come into my house. I mean, this is a Roman officer of, of over a hundred men, and he's supposed to be ruling that whole territory. I do not deserve to have you come into my house. Just give the order and my servant will get well. Yeah. Now, today we are, we're, we're saturated with the ideas that Radio waves are out there and all kinds of other things flying through the air that we can't see. But what evidence do they have of that in their day? But what's he saying? He's saying somehow or other, Jesus is going to speak the words and somehow gonna that's going to have an influence on his, on his servant that's over there in his house. Tremendous faith. Yeah. I too am a man under the authority of superior officers, and I have soldiers under me. I order this one, go, and he goes, and I order another one, come, and he comes, and I order my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was surprised and said to the people following him, I tell you, I have never found anyone in Israel with faith like this. And for those of you who have the books available, pull out your Desire of Ages and read 315, page 315 to 317. The full story, it's amazing. That was so sad that Jesus wanted to give the message to the Jews. Yeah. So badly. Mm -hmm. And here it was, was their captors, really. Yeah. yeah. That got the message. What, what amazes me now, uh, uh, when he was uh, starting his ministry you know can any good thing come out of nazareth yeah and now we got a radio station there yep took a long time to get but we're spreading the word now yeah that's marvelous i have that in my mind often well despite his powerful position and the backing of rome i mean he had the backing of rome to everything he did yeah this roman centurion came humbly to jesus asking for a favor he did not even want to approach Jesus himself, but asked that others make the request to Jesus on his behalf. But one, and, he, and who's he asking for? He's not asking for himself. He's asking for a, his Jewish servant that worked for him. Um, but wanting to demonstrate such an incredible faith exhibited by the centurion himself, Jesus continued toward his house until the centurion himself approached Jesus. Then came those marvelous words recorded in Matthew 10:10 10, 10, as above, I tell you, I have never found anyone in Israel with faith like this. Um, here's a question. What language was the centurion speaking? What language was Jesus speaking? He was a Roman. A Roman, yes. Uh, and the common language of the people, of the expatriate people in those days was Greek, Koine Greek. Yeah, yeah. But the common language of the local people was Aramaic. So which one do you think he was using? Any idea? We don't know. I don't know. That's why I, I, I thought he would have spoken Latin, but uh, maybe not. Maybe. Yeah. Well, look at a couple of passages. Isaiah 42, verse 3. 
he will, talking about the Messiah to come, now this is 700 years before Christ, he will not break off a bent reed or put out a flickering lamp. He will bring lasting judge justice to all. And Colossians 4, 5 to 6, be wise in the way you act towards those who are not believers, making good use of every opportunity you have. Your speech should always be pleasant and interesting, and you should know how to give the right answer to everyone. And of course, that's also in, in Peter, but Ephesians 4, verse 15 says, Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Well, Jesus was always extremely gentle and loving in his dealing with even the worst of sinners. He challenges us to be wise, number one, to make good use of every opportunity, using speech that is pleasant and interesting, and three, to be ready to give the right answer to anyone who asks us. And all of this is to be done in love. Jesus had the, ar had the ability to heal people physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And he did, all, excuse me, he did all of this in the most gracious manner. He saw the needs of people, whether they were based on loneliness, sorrow, heartache, or physical disease. He provided them with healing, joy, and hope. Jesus ministered to people's felt needs because that gave him an opportunity to deal with their deepest needs, their real needs. Okay? Jesus got into the boat and went back across the lake to his own town, where some people brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus, and, and if you read, uh, I think it's Luke, it says they, they tried to get to Jesus and they couldn't get to him, so they climbed up on the roof and tore out some of the tiles from the roof and let the man down through the roof right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw how much faith they had, notice they had, he said to the paralyzed man, Courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. Well, guess what? That stirred up a real hornet's nest. Then some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This man is speaking blasphemy. So did Jesus hear it? How did he know they were saying this to themselves? It says he perceived them what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. Jesus perceived what they were thinking. So he said, why are you thinking such evil things? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, you need to understand a little bit about Aramaic and Hebrew to really get the full impact of this verse. When he says, son of man, what is he really saying? That's a term which means human being. Yeah. This human being ha here on earth has the power to forgive sins. Why does this human being have the power to forgive sins? He's God. He is God. Yes. Yeah, think of the implications of that. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your bed and go home. The man got up and went home. When the people saw it, they were afraid and praised God for giving such authority to people. So you see, here they see it as having given authority to a human being. Now here's, the, here's what you need to understand in order to understand why Jesus did that. It was the belief of the spiritual leaders and teachers in the days of Jesus that physical diseases were a direct result of that person's sin. So, on a larger scale, it's true, we all admit that sin is the cause of disease and sickness. However, it is not true that every disease is a direct result of a specific sin of a specific person. But see, they believe that it was. So, if you heal the person, what are you going to do about the cause of their disease? See, if you believe that their sin is a direct cause for their sickness, don't you have to get rid of the cause in order to get rid of, in order to heal them? That was the question. You see, that was the issue here. So, um, when his friends brought that paralyzed man and lowered him through the roof in front of Jesus, Jesus responded, Courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. And he did this on purpose. He didn't have to say that. Yeah. 
This, of course, led the teachers of the law to accuse him of blasphemy. So Jesus, in effect, said, Okay, since you believe that his sins have led to this disease, if I can heal his disease, it will prove that I can forgive his sins. So Jesus did exactly that, telling the man to get up and walk, and the man did. <laughs> and what do you do? You know, all the people are rejoicing because the man's healed, and the, and the scribes and the Pharisees are rumbling in the background. Yeah. I mean, how can you be completely out of touch with the world, right? Direct opposite. Okay, I'm going to take you to another story, Mark 5, 25. There was a woman who had suffered terribly from severe bleeding for 12 years, even though she had been treated by many doctors. She had spent all her money, but instead of getting, sounds like they had expensive health care in those days too, but instead of getting better, she got worse all the time. She had heard about Jesus, so she came in the crowd behind him, saying to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will get well. She touched his cloak and her bleeding stopped at once. And she had the feeling inside herself that she was healed of her trouble. At once, Jesus knew that power had gone out of him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? I mean, think about this. Everybody there wants to get close to him and touch him. His disciples answered, You see how many people are crowding you. Why do you ask you who touched you? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. The woman realized what had happened to her, so she came, trembling with fear, knelt at his feet, and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, My daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your trouble. Now, if you read Ellen White again, which I w would encourage you, especially the book Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, 319 to 322, you get all the details. This woman with the menorrhagia had tried to get help from every possible source without any improvement. And for those of us who have to deal with that kind of stuff once in a while, it can be a real, a real pain. Then she heard about Jesus. Ellen White tells us she thought, well, she would just come to Jesus, she would present her case, he would heal her, just like that, no problem. She had no idea how many people were, uh, were trying to crowd around Jesus. So when she finally realized the crowd was there, she thought to herself, if I could just yeah. touch his cloak. She did, and she was healed. But Jesus did not allow that opportunity to pass without commenting, co commending her faith and encouraging her spiritually. So Jesus, I mean, think about this. What, what is Jesus saying? He's saying every time he sees great faith, the centurion, this woman, what does he want to do? Heal. He, he, wa he wants to make it known. Yeah. He said, all you people who are crowding in here, look at the example of this woman. Look at the, man, look at the example of this centurion. Right? Yeah. We need to remember that everything that, everyone that Jesus healed physically eventually died. He, they were just healed physically. They weren't, hurt, weren't made eternally well. But Jesus' goal for them was not simply so they could be healthier sinners. He wanted them to accept the life of etern the gift of eternal life. That was his ultimate goal for every patient, right? Yeah. So what are we as Christians doing to share eternal life with those around us? Jim, I think that's yours. Or is it Carrie? It's Carrie. Yeah. No, it's mine, yes. Sorry. I'm reading from Matthew 4, verses 23 to 25. Jesus went all over Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news about the kingdom and healing people who had all kinds of disease and sickness. The news about him spread through the whole country of Syria so that people brought to him all those who were sick, suffering from all kinds of diseases and disorders, people with demons and epileptics and paralytics, and Jesus healed them all. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the ten towns from Jerusalem, Judea, and the land on the other side of the Jordan. That's from the Good News Bible. And if you compare that with other passages, <clears throat> there were people from hundreds of miles away had come to find Jesus to be healed. I mean, Syria. 
I mean, that's a long way. If you go to the far, the far side of Syria, you're almost at, oh, the border of Syria is in Turkey. Turkey. Imagine traveling from Turkey all the way down to Galilee to, to be healed. And you're not, you know, you're sick. Yeah. What's so fascinating to me is that these were people that were so strongly believing in the Jewish traditions. Mm -hmm. And there were, which, uh, overpowering their life with these yeah. rules and whatever. Following all of that, and they gave, th their faith overstepped all of that. Mm -hmm. And they stepped out not knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. Not knowing whether they were going to be killed, whether the rabbis were going to reject them, or what. Exactly. Well, we notice here something very significant. Jesus taught, he preached, and he healed. Mm -hmm. That combined threefold ministry was a most effective way to reach people. Every, even today, as Ellen White explained, if we can reach people not only spiritually, but also mentally, emotionally, and physically as well, our work will be more successful. I have been surprised at being asked by physicians if I did not think it would be more pleasing to God for them to give us their medical practice, give up, give up their medical practice and enter the ministry. I am prepared to answer such an inquirer. If you are a Christian and a competent physician, you are qualified to do tenfold more good as a missionary for God than if you were to go forth merely as a preacher of the word. I would advise young men and women to give heed to this matter. Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. So Jesus had a threefold ministry. We read up there earlier. What were the three things that he did? Preach, heal, teach. And taught, yeah. Oh. So the more of those, if you can bring two things together, that's better than just one. And three, all three together is even better. Okay, go ahead. The whole world will be involved in perplexity and distress, disease of every kind will be upon the human family, and such ignorance as now prevails concerning the laws of health would result in great suffering and the loss of many lives that might be saved. Ellen White, wow. Councils on Health, page 503, 504. So, I was going to say, uh, we as a church comparatively recently have made active meetings along these lines. And it's only fairly recent. I mean, we did stuff here and there, but we're actually doing more of it. Mm -hmm. Be it dentists, MDs, nurses, whatever. I think that's along the same line. Yeah. So what's, what's these words telling you? I mean, Ellen White is just commenting on the life of Jesus. Yeah. She's saying, okay, people are attracted by his healing. People are attracted by his teaching. The people are attracted by his preaching. Well, what if you have all three of those skills? Yeah. You know? It, it clearly it, it was, a, was a winning combo. Jesus would sometimes spend an entire day healing the sick. Now, do you think that wearied him? Oh, yes. Walking around, talking, being mobbed by people all around yeah. him. I am sure sick people were pushing and shoving just to get near him. Yeah. But Jesus knew that his, I mean, later on when we talk about the apostles, Peter and Paul, people were trying to just get a handkerchief that he had touched yeah. and it would heal them. I mean, amazing stuff. Jesus knew that his mission on this earth could be destroyed if he allowed himself to be simply a healer of physical diseases. And you know that, I mean, People have been, he would have been very happy to just fill up his time from early morning to late at night healing people. So, what did Jesus, how did Jesus respond to all that? I think this is, is that yours? Oh, that's mine. Mark 1, 32 to 39. After the sun had set and evening had come, people brought to Jesus all the sick and those who had demons. All the people of the town gathered in front of the house. Jesus healed many were sick with all kinds of diseases and drove out many demons. He would not let the demons say anything because they knew who he was. Okay, I have to comment about that. What does that mean? He wouldn't let the demons 
say anything because they knew who he was. Why not? I mean, why not tell everybody? This is Jesus. He's the Messiah. But there were times when he, he didn't want people to know. Yeah, why? So he was, he was interceding there, was he not? Uh, he wouldn't let the demons do what demons do. Yeah, exactly. And that is... Well, the real reason, the biggest thing, there are probably more than one reason, but the biggest reason was the Jews had such a perverted idea of what the Messiah was like that if, if all the demons kept announcing him as the Messiah... Well, the Jews would say, okay, if he's the Messiah, let's take him to Jerusalem, we'll crown him a king. Yeah. And he would have interrupted his right, the work that he came to actually to do. So, do you think the demons knew who he was? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, man, they knew who he was, exactly. Yeah. Very early the next morning, so he's worked it late into the evening, long before daylight, Jesus got up and left the house. He went out of the town to a lonely place where he prayed. But Simon and his companions went, went out searching for him. And when they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. But Jesus answered, We must go on to the other villages around here. I have to preach in them also, because that is why I came. So he traveled all over Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. Okay? Preaching, healing, Were the teaching. demons... Just what we call mental illness today, psychosis and, and schizophrenia, or were, do we have demons today in people? Well, probably, yes, I think they are. I, I can tell you, I know, and, my, my, and they're much less, in, in a more, more educated societies, the devil is hoping that we, and he's been quite successful at convincing people that he doesn't exist. And why would he want to convince us that he doesn't exist? He can keep working. Well, yeah, that's part of it. But more than that, I want you to think about this. The day is going to come, as we approach the very end, he's going to start performing miracles. Yes. Revelation 13 says he's going to perform yes. miracles. And what happens if he performs miracles? What are people going to say? Must be God, right? Yes. They don't believe the devil exists, so it must be God. And that's exactly what he wants them to think. Yeah. Exactly. What he but I can tell you um, um, of a story that I know specifically from my personal experience. I worked, lived and worked very near a place among the Maasai in Tanzania. Yeah. And this was in the days when there were virtually no Maasai that had become, become Adventists. And one, one pastor had worked with one, one woman from the Messiah area, and she wanted to be baptized. And people had said, you know, this lady's got special connections and so forth, that she might actually be demon-possessed. But she really wanted to be baptized. And they kept asking her, and they said, yeah, okay, if you really want to be baptized. They went down into in the water in a stream, and the pastor couldn't, couldn't actually bend her over. He couldn't get her under the water. So the they, they, second pastor came down and they prayed, and both of them together, and then they were able to baptize her, both of them working together. It wasn't the woman that kept her from dunking under the water. No, no. Mm. Schizophrenia is kind of like, there's a line. There's a sort of a mild, and there's a very serious one yeah. on the other end. I've seen folk that I was pretty sure they had something else. And tech, tactile hallucinations. I've seen yeah. people terrorized. Can't you see oh, yeah. this? Yeah. They describe it. it. It's there. Big elephants and spiders on the wall and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, it should be clear in this story that every act of healing that Jesus did, he considered as an opportunity to reveal God's character, relieve suffering, and hopefully point the sufferer to eternal life. On the last day of his public ministry, which was just two days before his crucifixion, the disciples approached Jesus to ask him about his comment that the temple in Jerusalem would one day be destroyed. Remember he had said, not one stone will be left on another? Yeah. After talking about events leading up to the end, and that would be Matthew 24, end of our world, Jesus told three parables as recorded in Matthew 25. 
Jim? These parables outline the character qualities that really matter to Jesus for the people waiting for his second coming. The parable of the ten virgins emphasizes the importance of genuine, authentic, spirit-filled, spirit-filled life. The parable of the well, ten... Let's, let's, um, let's interrupt for just a second. So, what was the difference between the wise virgins and the foolish virgins? Well, the wise ones prepared, prepared for a, a, a and they delay. Had, and they had extra oil with yeah. them, so they were prepared. So, that's what we're talking about, a genuine, authentic, spirit-filled life, okay? The parable of the ten talents undermines the import, uh, underlines the importance of faithfully using the gifts that God has given to each of us. The yep. parable of the sheep and goats reveals that genuine Christianity truly ministers to the needs of those God brings t- into their, excuse me, into our lives each day. There is a hidden hunger and a thirst for Jesus in the souls of human beings that longs to be satisfied, John 6, 35, John, 14, John 4, 13 and 14. We are all strangers longing for home until we discover our true identity in Christ, Ephesians 2, 12, 13 and 19. We are naked spiritually until clothed with his Righteousness, Revelation 3, 18, Revelation 19, 7 and 8. I'm going to read those two verses just to emphasize this. Look at Revelation 3, 18. This is a very familiar verse, but just to remind us, I advise you, this is Jesus speaking to that, the final church, the Laodicean church. We believe we are part of Laodicea today. I advise you then to buy gold from me, pure gold in order to be rich, Buy also white clothing to dress yourself and cover up your shameful nakedness. But buy also some ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Be be in earnest then and turn from your turn from your sins. Not just cover them up, but turn from them. Okay, and then we'll see what what's the result of that over in night chapter nineteen, seven and eight. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us praise his greatness for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb and his bride has prepared herself for it. She has been given clean, shining linen to wear. The the linen is the good deeds of God's people. Okay? So that, putting those two verses together, we conclude that God's plan is for his people to become more and more like him, to shed their bad habits and so forth like this, and gradually become more and more like Jesus himself. So, Jesus is the answer. Have you heard that expression before? Uh Or as we sometimes say around Christmas time, Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus is the remedy for every life-threatening disease that might affect us, including sin itself, which is the most deadly of all diseases. The parable of the sheep and goats recorded in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And I think we have time to read that real quickly. When the Son of Man comes as king and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne and the people of all the nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people on his right and the others on his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry, and you fed me. Thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you received me in your homes. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. In prison, and you visited me. The righteous will then ask, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Are thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you in our homes or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in, per- or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Away from me, ye that, uh, you that are under God's curse. Away to the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you would not feed me. 
thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you would not welcome me in your homes. Naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you would not take care of me. Then they will answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you, hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and would not help you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you refuse to help one of the least, these least important ones, you refuse to help me. These, then, will be sent off to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. Wow. How can we reach out to meet the needs of so many people around us? Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in man, but they appreciate acts of sympathy and helpfulness. As they see one with no inducement of earthly praise or compensation coming into their homes, ministering to the sick, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, comforting the sad, and tenderly pointing all to him of whose love and pity the human worker is but a messenger. As they see this, their hearts are touched. Gratitude springs up, faith is kindled, they see that God cares for them, and they are prepared to listen as his word is opened. That's from Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, page 145, paragraph 1. When I read that, I'm reminded of a verse of the Bible. Can you guess which one that reminds me of? John 13, 34, and 35. Do you remember what it says there? Let me just go there really quick. Uh, hold on, let's try again here. John 13, 34. Okay. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love one for another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Yeah. What does that say about everybody else? They're not. They're not. Yeah. They're not loving. They're not kind. They're not gentle, like, just like that passage said. Okay? So these people, when they see somebody like that, what happens? Gratitude springs up. Faith is kindled. They see that God cares for them, and they are prepared to listen as his word is opened. So, we need to have that kind of love and that kind of caring. So we have the exceedingly challenging task of mixing with the world without being contaminated by its sin. Can we do that? If we were really as selfless, caring, gracious, kind, and loving as Jesus was, the devil would do everything he possibly could to destroy us and our ministry. Let's be clear about that. So, what is Satan most worried about? Destroying us. He's most worried about people who are faithfully representing Jesus, right? Yep. If you, the closer we get to Jesus, the more Satan hates us, right? So we need to, we need to be clear about that. That's not, that shouldn't be a mystery to anybody who knows about the great controversy. Are there other kinds of ministries that we are as individual churches and individual church members uh, could be involved in that would better represent Jesus? Millennia ago, in the vast heavenly realms of space, Lucifer rebelled against God. He claimed that God was unfair, unjust, unloving. And Jesus' life testifies to his Father's immense love. Every miracle of healing reveals the Father's love. Every time a demon-possessed individual is delivered, it speaks of the Father's love. Every time Jesus feel, feeds the hungry, comforts the sorrowing, forgives the guilty, strengthens the weak, severs the chains of sin, or raises the dead, he reveals the Father's love. Amen. Adult wow. Teacher's Sabbath School Guide, page 106. Okay. Have you ever tried to be salt and light to the world around us? Think of the implications of that. Are our lives like lights in the darkness? Do people, do people think we're different? Can they, say any, can they see anything different about us? Oh, yeah. 
I think at times they do, more than we think sometimes. Yeah. Some ancient Christians thought that they could solve the problem of being contaminated by the world by making themselves completely and totally separate. A famous example was Simon Stylites. He moved outside of a small town near Aleppo, Syria, and built himself a tower 10 feet tall and lived on top of it, eventually extending that tower to nearly 60 feet. In the small space available to him at the top of the tower, he exercised, prayed, counseled people who sought him out, and finally died. There were times when he fasted for long periods of time, even before he built the tower, I might add, and people thought he was crazy. Earlier in his life, he fasted in a hut for so long that he could hardly stand. But his situation was so remarkable that people sought him, assuming that he must be a saint, right? To feed himself, he had small boys from the nearby village who would climb up the pillar and pass parcels of flatbread and goat's milk to him. How would you like to live on flatbread and goat's milk? Sometimes he would pull up larger quantities of food in a bucket by a pulley system. If you get our handout that's available at our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you'll see that there's a website that you could go to and learn all about simian stylitis. But uh, since we don't have that here, I'm going to give you just a snapshot of that. Here's a little bit about simian stylitis. Simeon Stylites, okay? Sixth century depiction of Simeon on his column. A scallop shell symbolizing spiritual purity blesses Simeon. The serpent represents demonic temptations. So there you see him between the, the, the divinity and the shell above him and the snake below him, okay? And you can, there's a little bit closer picture and you can see Simeon sitting up there on his pillar and the, the, the t snake is trying to tempt him from down below and God is blessing him from up above, okay? Well, and here's a 16th century, I, now he lived in probably the second, the third, third or fourth century. These, that first one was from 6th century. This is now the 16th century icon of Simeon Stylites. At the base of the pillar is his mother's body. That he lived in the 6th century. Even before the 6th okay. century, yeah. So, and guess what? His church, a church built to him, is still there. Ruins of the church of St. Simeon with remains of his column. That little thing in the middle there is, a, is what's left of his column, which, and they're just a rock on top of it. So what we have is those two little squares at the bottom that, that, that was the base for his column. And you can see it a little, better, a little bit better there. Incredible, huh? Yeah. Well, people are still trying to get nearer to God this way. The Kachki Pillar, this is in Georgia, not Georgia in the United States, but in the country of Georgia, is a natural limestone monolith located at the village of Kachki in western Georgian region of Emereti, near the town of Chiatura is approximately 40 meters or 130 feet high and overlooks a small river, small river valley of Akachkura. But So someone's up there trying to be a saint. How would you like to live at the top of that 130 feet up? Not really. Wow. Okay, let's see if we can get back to where we were here. Um... <coughs> Oh. When we're driving through long areas of pasture land or mm -hmm. or forest, and you see a house, and then it might be a mile or two, you see another. Mm -hmm. My husband and I often look at it. You know, it takes a certain kind of a person yeah. to be that isolated, to be to enjoy just they enjoy what they do. Nature is wonderful, yeah. but there's a certain kind of person that just doesn't need. Yeah, to be the other. hubbub that we're used to. Yeah. <laughs> well, by contrast to this experience of Simon Stalites, Jesus prayed in that very famous prayer recorded in John 17, quote, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, 
but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Someone has suggested, quote, Christians are like a boat in the water. It is all right for the boat to be in the water if there's no water in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, was quite good. Think of the scathing rebukes Jesus could have given to the people like the woman caught in adultery, the Samaritan woman at the well, or even Peter after his denial. But his words were always kind and gentle and full of forgiveness. Jesus' method of evangelism, this is uh, from our Adult Teacher's Bible Study Guide, if I remember correctly here. Yeah. Jesus' method of evangelism was to find a need and meet it. Find a need, meet it. How, off, how good are we at that? His comprehensive threefold ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing, we mentioned that earlier, transformed lives. The Gospels reveal Jesus meeting the felt needs of people so that he could touch them at the point of their deepest spiritual needs. So what were their felt needs? They were demon-possessed. They were sick. They had leprosy. Any one of a whole variety of things. So Jesus met them with their, took care of their felt needs so he could do what? Communicate the truth. Yep. Talk about their spiritual needs. So think about the Gospel of John, for example. In John 2, at the wedding feast of Cana and Galilee, Jesus meets a social need by saving the host from embarrassment. <laughs> Every time I think of that story, I have to chuckle myself because, you know, here's this stuff, family, and these are relatives of Jesus. Mary was there helping out with things, so obviously it was a family wedding. And Jesus says, well, and I don't know, I don't, we don't know, of course, what the quality of the stuff was that they were drinking before, but I'm sure that what Jesus came up with was pure, fresh grape juice. Yes, yes. And the people thought, I mean, they must have thought, what in the world? Where, probably the wrong time of year for fresh grape juice, where did he get this stuff? Anyway, in John 3, Jesus meets Nicodemus' deepest heartfelt hunger, for an authentic faith, even though he was a member of the Sanhedrin, a uh, uh, um, Pharisee. In John 4, Jesus treats a Samaritan woman with dignity and respect, meeting her emotional needs for a sense of self-worth. And think of her background. In John 5, Jesus meets physical needs in the miraculous healing of a desperately ill man who hopelessly lies by a pool of purportedly therapeutic waters for 38 years. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope he wasn't there at that same spot for 38 years, but man, even, even, even one year. Yes. Mm. In John 6, when Jesus breaks the bread and feeds 5,000 hungry people, the crowd wants to make him king. And you, you know those verses. Look at John 6, 14 and 15. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, Surely this is the prophet. What does that mean? Who was to come into the world. Where does it talk about that? Do you remember? Moses was told, I will send a prophet like you. Okay. Jesus knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force. So he went off again to the hills by himself. Okay. So that's back to our question why Jesus didn't told the, the demons not to tell people who he was because that's what they would have done. They would have said, I, you know, I, we know that you're humble and, you know, just a very humble guy, but you're our king. We've got to crown you. You've got to get on with your work. We know what you're supposed to do, right? What made Jesus' popularity so high at this point in his ministry? I mean... 5,000 people ate the best food they'd ever eaten. So what did they do the next morning? Where's breakfast, right? The world had never seen anyone with so much unselfish love who could meet their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs. It was here in John 6 that Jesus preached that powerful sermon on the bread of life. For the first time, many of his hearers understood that he was calling for a deeper spiritual commitment, a commitment that many of them 
were unwilling to make, so they walked away. And you remember the story. Saving sinners was Jesus' most important mission, and everything he did, whether it was a healing or teaching or simply talking to people, was for the purpose of leading to their salvation. He wanted to deliver people from the bondage of sin. And as we said, those three techniques, those three methods he used, teaching, healing, preaching. That's the way he did it. So who are, and so if that was the best way for Jesus to do things, what about us? We should try as far as possible to use any of those skills that we have, right? Yeah. So think about it now. Who around you needs kind, loving attention and help? Could it be the single mom who needs a break? You know, you could go yeah. watch your kids for a little bit while she gets away. An elderly retired man who has lost his wife, probably feeling very lonely, wishing for a little companionship. A young couple that has just moved into the neighborhood. They want, they want to know, they want to feel like they're a part of the community. They want, they want to be accepted. So go and reach out to them. Or perhaps someone who needs to quit smoking. Could you help them? Adopt a healthier lifestyle. Come and walk with me in the morning, right? Lose weight, maybe. Well, let's do whatever it is. Let's exercise together. Reduce stress or exercise more. And just knowing that you have a friend in your community that cares about you and so forth is a st great stress reliever. Um, could we reach out to such people and make a difference in their lives? On our way to introducing them to the Jesus Christ we know and love, I mean, that's what Jesus did all the time. So if we're going to, if we, if, and we need to, pra we need to practice ways of making that transition. Okay, here's some cookies. Welcome to the community. Uh, can we help you? Do you know where the church is? Do you know this? Do you know that? We need to think of, you know, subtle ways that are not sort of gross, how we can sort of encourage people to take that next step to, to join the, to become, well, to learn about the Bible, to learn about Jesus, and, and to join the church if possible. So there's lots of things that we could do, lots of things that we should do, and this is the challenge that's being presented to us in this series of lessons. I hope it works. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, think of what would it be like if you had 20 million Adventists really out there, reaching out to others, convincing them that they should uh, know more about you and come to love you better. Lord, we, we are here trying to do our best. Help us also to reach out to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.